हेलो अ वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू वन एंड ऑल प्रेजेंट हियर आई वेलकम यू ऑल फॉर टूडेज लेक्चर बाई मिस्टर उमेश मल्होत्रा सीरियल एंटरप्रेन्योर इन एंड बी टेक फ्रॉम आई आई टी मद्रास इन मेटोलॉजिकल इंजीनियरिंग बैच ऑफ नाइनटीन नाइन्टी द टल फॉर टूडेज लेक्चर इज ऑन्टरप्रेन्योरशिप कॉलिंग बट बिफोर दैट आई वुड लाइक टू गिव अ ब्रीफ इन इन्फो अबाउट द स्पीकर फॉर टूडे मिस्टर उमेश मल्होत्रा इज अ सीरियल ऑन्टरप्रेन्योर विद एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ वर्किंग अक्रॉस अ रेंज ऑफ मार्केट्स एंड प्रोडक्ट कैटेगरीज ही हेज सोल्ड एंड सर्विस कस्टमर्स इन यू एस यूरोप एंड इंडिया and has a significant experience working with ngos and consumers in indian villages he has worked in product categories like it services restaurants education retail and social entrepreneurship his organization's hippo campus is known globally as a game changer in education for the poor he is a ashoka and asia society fellow and a graduate of it madras he is now actively running a network of preschools and schools for rural india and in his talk he intend to share through anecdotes the glamour and heartbreaks of corporate life entrepreneurship social entrepreneurship and what it means to change the world so uh, without much ado i would like to call the speaker mr umesh malhotra to start the lecture um thank you uh, i would like to thank iit for giving me this chance to come and speak to all of you on what my life journey has been um i would like to thank all of you for taking out time on a friday afternoon uh, when i was in college friday afternoons were not meant for doing this so uh, thank you for taking time out um you know i've got an hour and uh, i intend to spend 30 minutes of the time talking about myself okay because that's what i was asked to do and then maybe 10 minutes talking about what i think entrepreneurship is all about and then 20 minutes of questions <clears throat> a lot of things in my life have happened completely by accident getting into iit was also an accident but i think through all these accidents and i'll tell you about the different accidents that happened in my life one thing was always there i wanted to be an entrepreneur i did not know what that meant but i wanted to be an entrepreneur uh i'll tell you starting in the first accident i was possibly in 10th grade and my teacher in school asked me asked the children in 10th grade saying how many of you want to do commerce and i raised my hand saying i want to do commerce and she said no you come in the top 5 in school you go to science so there i was in 11th doing science and then you know and i went to this really really mago school called dav i'm sure some of you in chennai know about that mago school you know totally mago school it really lived up to the name somebody gave me ir iyengar school technology right so uh, dav school was full of ir iyengars and we spent the last row used to be full of kids sitting out there and out smarting teachers and then doing resnik holiday problems for fun and somehow i got trapped into this and i was introduced to the world of agarwal and brilliance and i managed to convince my parents it was a good investment iit is a great place to go to and i got them to spend some money on sending me for tutorials and to my surprise i got into iit uh well i uh, pretty much was the last one to squeeze into the metallurgy department i was like the last rank that got into metallurgy Uh, so i didn't yeah. and i was pretty much the lowest of the graduating batch in terms of gpa uh, but through iit in four years i you know i had a blast so my first summer i failed a lot of courses right i finished in four years i failed a lot of courses so the first summer was the only summer i had where i could actually go out and try entrepreneurship uh, the remaining summers i was doing summer courses right physics too and maths too and that kind of stuff uh so the first summer me and uh, one more guy from iit we decided to go and sell washing machines to garages you know kivraj motors and saying you know if you use washing machines and you can reuse the oil and uh, you can clean your parts and you know you can save money on oil we tried selling this to you know people didn't buy and we didn't make a single sale we spent two weeks 
taking around some silly washing machine this guy's father had made walking to garage by garage and trying to hawk a product which didn't sell but i actually enjoyed the experience i enjoyed the experience of failure i was like you know why don't and you're sitting out there in a garage i don't know how many of you have sat in a garage which cleans up motorbike parts kivraj motors kind of stuff right sitting in a garage and saying i'll do a demo of the machine for you so you're bloody picking up all these old parts and putting it in the washing machine and saying see how much oil we saved what we changed but hey, nothing nothing sold Uh, but actually i would uh, like to thank iit for the first experience i got of uh, doing entrepreneurship i ran quark at iit and uh, you know it was a very funny model of running quark in iit um if you did a good job you got no money because it was jimkana money right it was not like your money right you sold some stuff iit and if you made a loss you lost no money it is actually fancy entrepreneurship right you do some stuff if you make a loss you don't lose money if you make a profit you don't make any money what was my motivation i was making no money i was out there uh, I, you know at quark and i'm glad to see a beautiful quark today I was out there from 5:30 p.m. to 11:11:30 11, p.m. pretty much most nights. Even after having uh, drinks and being stoned, I would be going to uh, Quark at 11:11:30 11, to check on the cash box. But I made no money, and I actually enjoyed it. I did not know then why, but I actually enjoyed it. Uh, the next year we had other people running quark and they actually uh, ran, it, ran it for 9 10 months and they found it to be a bit difficult and i actually jumped in to run it for the last 2 months of my fourth year too no idea why but i enjoyed it i went in uh accidentally one of these days i was telling you guys i bottomed the uh, uh, metallurgy uh, i was walking around this streets back from class and uh, i walked into the placement office i was very clear i didn't want an engineering job and i think it was my way of telling me that uh, hey you won't get an engineering job anyway so it's not like about you wanting an engineering job because with the gpa you've got you're not going to have tata steel picking you up uh, i wanted a job which was based in bangalore because i just love the city for the weather and the beer and uh, my luck i walked into placement office and uh, there were two companies which were uh, recruiting for people in bangalore one was indial and second was infosys and uh, that morning i went in you know i said hey boss two companies recruiting metallurgy guy this is like fancy today is my golden day found the best shirt my friend had kind of stuff wore it and came for interview Uh, I screwed up my Indian interview. Okay, completely screwed up. They asked me questions like, you know, I hope Professor Murthy is not here, right? They asked me questions like, what does uh, uh, carbon do to iron, and what does nickel do to steel, kind of stuff, right? I was like, uh, blasphemy! How dare you ask me questions like that, right? In a management interview, not even a graduate engineer. I was going for a management trainee interview. How dare you ask me questions like that? but anyway they did and i obviously goofed big time and i also gave some stupid arrogant answers and i was cut off the job fortunately at infosys uh, i got the job um and i think my job at infosys was purely uh, they were a small company then unknown company they were looking for anybody who would join so they were not very discerning right and they knew that if they went for toppers in college they would not join the small company so they went for the bottomers they were like hey get let's get this bottom of the cream and this bottom of the cream will work really well because who will give them a job anyway and uh, you know the only person we will lose them to is the im so we'll take a chance on this and half of them join me i'm fantastic it was a god forsaken company guys you know um, and gobal joined 92 right 
And you're trying to, when you join Infos, right? But 90, uh, God for second company, small company. You know, in today's world, uh, when I compare, maybe that time it looked okay because they had tables and chairs and all that. But when you compare in today's world, it was like a really small company. You know, you had land cables running around. And uh, sometimes you would uh, walk a bit too fast, trip over the land cable and everybody's network was down. The company stopped working for one hour because somebody walked a bit too fast and tripped over a land cable. That was the state of infrastructure. So anyway, I got into uh, Infosys, and you guys won't believe it. In the in the first two years at Infosys, I quit three times. Why? I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to be my own boss. Uh, I had no idea this was the hottest startup in the country. Right? We didn't even know what a startup meant. In 1990, Infosys revenue was. Uh, $250,000, so the crore rupees in revenue. Nobody, you don't even know this is the hottest startup, you know, they weren't even talked about. And I quit to say I'm going to start my own business. Fortunately for me, just pure plain luck, right? Again, accidents happen in life for the better. Pure plain luck. Those guys in Infosys kept convincing me, saying I'm making a mistake by quitting. And, you know, they would say, just shut up and go to work. So that's the way the board would treat me. Yeah, just go on and go to work, right? We're not accepting resignation. You've got work to do. We've got work to do. Uh, and uh, they never accepted my resignation. And they treated me like a small child who deserved to be treated like, you know, a pampered child from IIT who is just full of himself and he thinks he can change the world. I'm actually thankful they thought of me like that. Right? Because if I had possibly left them then, it would have been a big blunder. I worked with them and sometime around 97 is when I decided to quit the third time. And I went to Narayan Murthy and I said, sir, I want to quit. He said, why? He says, uh, I told him, I want to do an MBA. When that gets back to the fact that, you know, uh, but yeah, I want an MBA, he asked me. He said, uh, why do you want an MBA? So he's like, you know, I think it's a fancy thing to do. Everybody seems to have an MBA and I seem to be stuck somewhere without an MBA. He's like, you're doing very well. You know, you are work seven years in the company. You possibly have, you know, more than a crore rupees in stock options already. So what are you bitching about? Right? And we were like 27 then. And uh, I was like, no, I want to do MBA. So he said, you know, I'm going to give you a chance to see whether you're good at doing an MBA or not. So I'm actually going to move you to the US to run a business vertical. Again, completely accidental. I went in to complain about something and ask for more and demand for more because I thought MBA will give me entrepreneurship. And uh, I was shipped to the US, given a vertical which was doing a revenue of $100,000 and said, now go grow this. This is what it means to be a manager. Again, plain, simple luck, financial services industry, Bay Area, didn't have to do a shit. In 18 months, $100,000 became $5 million. I was running 5% of the company. Company went public in NASDAQ. I was like, wow, this is really cool. And you know, when I was in, uh, uh, and then I was like, this is real. And also, I think it was the best thing to happen to me because sitting in 99 is when Yahoo and Yahoo had gone public a few years back. The Bay Area was completely talking about Yahoo. Uh, Google was just coming out. And many of these companies, Amazon and all of those companies were just being talked about. So the buzz of entrepreneurship really, really got into me. You know, sitting out there in the Bay Area got into me. And uh, at the same time, you know, in 99, in 1989-90, I remember in this coffee shop. This coffee shop used to be a great hangout between classes. And those days, guys, we were luckier, right? We had 55% attendance, not like today, 75 or 80. So which meant that if you attended one class per semester, Every alternate class per semester, plus one extra class, you got 55%. So 
So you could go for period one, period two in the coffee shop, period three, period four in the coffee shop, right? That's the way it's be a routine of most guys, right? And then once a day, you have to do period five, two kind of stuff. So I had made this tall boast saying that in a decade of leaving IIT, I'm going to make a crore rupees for myself. In nine, crore rupees is a very small amount in today's world. But in 1989-1990, uh, the Infosys starting salary was 2,500 rupees a month, 3,000 rupees a year. Right? So a crore rupees was 300 times annual salary. Like today, if you guys get an average of 8 to 10 lakh rupees a year, that's like saying in 10 years, I'll have 24 crore rupees in the bank. So I had put this really, really massive target for myself saying I'm going to have a crore rupees in the bank by 1999. And I had more than a crore rupees in the bank by 1999. And I was like, somewhere on the place I need to follow the passion of entrepreneurship. And you know, please realize that the nine years of working in, in Infosys was truly entrepreneurial because at that point of time it was a company which grew from a revenue of $250,000 in 1990 to a revenue of $100 million in 1999 March. So if you look at it, nine years time, that company grew 500 times. Uh, in 1993, 94, they were unable to raise money in the stock market. In 1999, they were the first Indian company to be listed on NASDAQ. So you know, the beautiful dream run, right? Like, and no, no bad news, right? They always, hired people, they came back to IIT and they've been coming to colleges year on year for uh, two and a half decades. No significant bad news. Life went on for them and they kept building it. But I said, I want to do something on my own. And actually I was leaving more money on the table. And the reason I'm bringing some of these things on money, not to talk about money as it, but to set a context of the importance of money when you're doing entrepreneurship. Right? Because sometimes we confuse money and entrepreneurship. Uh, and I left more money on the table at Infosys and said I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I came back to India and uh, uh, I didn't want to do IT services. You know, I thought nine years, IT services, the IT service industry is dead. You know, just imagine how, sh same being in the industry, the business of the company was what, $100 million. And I said, you know, how much more can Infosys grow? You know, it's a fully capped out market, right? Infosys $100 million, t $150 million. How much more can the industry be, right? Uh, no IT services. We will do some fancy stuff like IT products or something like that, you know. I know some stuff, we'll do some. But I came back to India and... Uh, at the same time, there were some old friends who were doing a startup in IT services. And they managed to bamboozle me, right? And it was more booze than anything else, but they managed to really convince me one night saying that this is the best thing you can do, guy. Join us and we'll create this really cool startup. So we actually went ahead and uh, in 1999, November, I remember we... Uh, we raised $4 million without a single employee and without a single product, a single customer. Just based on the fact that there were five of us getting off our companies and working in IT services business. That's how hot the market was, right? Without anything, right? So we had, and 4 million those days is possibly maybe 10, 15 million today, right? Off the thing, we raised $4 million uh, and we started this business. It was called Bangalore Labs. We were India's first IT infrastructure management company. Uh, and it's, it's a very interesting experience because I was one of the five guys who had already made a million bucks. Right? And rest of my uh, co-founders were out trying to make their first million. And... Uh, from the word go, you had conflicts, value conflicts, because there were some people who wanted to take decisions on what will make them money, 
and then some people like me who want to who had these big dreams saying i worked in infosys they made a long lasting company guys let's think big and then they were like boss we're going to turn this company around in two and a half three years let's think small let's think opportunistic uh, and i'll give you a couple of anecdotes which happened which were really uh, uh, so we we had our struggles we were trying to build a business completely new new uh, area for india uh, it infrastructure never been done before we were the first guys set up a you know a network operation center in the country uh, we were managing networks of general motors and fosters beer out of india um, not really high tech stuff but we were doing some stuff and then we went out and raised some money So we were trying to raise money, trying to raise ten million dollars, and we actually had a term sheet from there. And then this bloke called Mark Anderson. I don't know how many of you heard of Mark Anderson, the guy who formed Netscape. I don't know how many of you know Netscape. Okay, so Netscape was the first commercially available browser before Explorer came and killed it. Okay, so Mark Anderson in the ninety-five uh, to two thousand era was like the Elon Musk of today. he was the guy who took bill gates on right he made the browser and then bill gates so because of what uh, bill gates and microsoft did with X internet explorer you know they were pulled up and hauled up significantly in courts for the anti competitive practices but so mark andreessen second startup was a company called loud cloud which was just a project which was 10 times bigger in vision than us which had just gone for an ipo in the us and that tanked miserably and just that tanked miserably and this 10 million dollar term sheet in front of us just vanished the term sheet just vanished saying you know let's give this 6 months time so we like screw it let's go back build the business And halfway through that, we realized there's a startup. You know, there's a first startup bus which happened in two thousand one, two thousand two. There was a startup bus which happened then. Um, and at the same time, I don't know how many of you know the Enron fiasco and the MCI fiasco. So they were like the big bus which happened. There were large companies like Enron and MCI. MCI was the number two telecom company in the world, which just went bankrupt overnight in two thousand one. So the market was pretty uh, anti startups and uh, all of that. and we had three people who wanted to buy us out we had three companies who wanted to buy us out uh, one a big indian multinational one a uh, us multinational and third a chinese company and uh, they were all having board meetings in the month of september 2001 to approve the transaction to do a first first cross you know for the for indian company was the first acquisition they were making 9/11 happened right and three companies became one the only buyer we had left was a chinese guy right and chinese guy really loved to negotiate he he could on the morning of 9/13 he was in india where the indian company and the american company were like no board has to decide on the morning of 9/13 the chinese guy was in india saying let's talk I'm going to give you a deal. Take it now. You have two days to say yes. Otherwise, take a walk. And right. and that guy actually uh, represented Malaysia's richest billionaire. He was one of the first partners of KPMG, youngest partner of KPMG. They bought our company, and they actually sold that company to Wipro for 450 crores four years later. We didn't make a shit. Oh, we made a yeah, little bit, you know, not 450 crores kind of shit, right? And that's why you look at it and say, how stupid are we? We knew we had a spinning story, right? And we were playing the game. Somebody who understood finance better than he, you did, came, negotiated better, spun the whole thing, took your business. took what you had created negotiated for 3 years with the cognizance and the satyams of the world sold to the highest bidder and he made a 10x in 2 years 
right, for doing nothing. So that's entrepreneurship. Okay. Uh, in 2002, at that time, uh, suddenly I had Chinese bosses, right? So two years back, I had these nice Iyengar Indian bosses, you know, Brahmin uh, bosses from Infosys, and two and a half years later, I had hardcore Chinese bosses. The only thing they saw was, you know, money. And I was like, this is not working for me, so I decided to leave. I think that was pretty much like the, uh, I would consider my first innings of entrepreneurship. Where I worked in a really cool startup, I thought we built something really nice, we saw the whole thing spin around, we went through acquisitions, we went through rejections, you know, it was like a, and I was 32. And in 2002, I was like, you know, I met somebody this afternoon, right? A guy called Kumar Medul, I think. I don't know if he's here. Okay. But Kumar was telling me about... So I was giving him some advice about some stuff he's trying to do with some one of something he's building out. And he listened to me for 10 minutes and said, so it's actually the corporate game I have to play to win. Okay. That was a comment he made. I was like, yep, some of the businesses, you have to play the corporate game. But in 2002, I realized that I was not cut out for the corporate game. I could do stuff, but you know, I think there was a, a lot of stuff which went into me personally, where I said, this is not what I cut out to do. And uh, I completely switched from the guy who wanted all of this glamour, big life, money, to saying, small is beautiful. Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful, became a Bible, right? Saying, is there something which you can do uh, you know, working within communities, doing things really small. And at that time, you know, one of the things which uh, you guys will learn when you go to the corporate world is, after you have a corporate career and you decide to take a break, headhunters will chase you for six months, maybe nine months, offering you jobs. If you say no ten times, the job will stop coming. Right? It, it, the whole thing changes. It actually was good for me because I said no many times. Because I was clear I didn't want to go back in the corporate world. But I had no idea what I wanted to do. My wife was building a library called Hippocampus. And I was uh, funding it. It was based in a uh, 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 suburb of uh, Bangalore City. And... Uh, Very funnily, uh, I was marketing in charge. I had no marketing experience, right? I was marketing in charge. As my job was to get kids into the library to come and use the library as customers. Sitting in the library, one and a half, two months, sitting in the library. One Sunday, I was sitting in the library, and I saw a bunch of children sitting there. They had come to the library. They picked up books. The library is a beautiful place, and I actually have, you know, I have paid one of the students here to stand up and testify. It's a beautiful place, right, Vandana? And you can stand up and say loudly, it's a beautiful place. More than IIT? <laughs> Fair enough. So uh, I just stumbled upon her out here. So, uh, so we built a place, but what actually it did to me? was the fact that I saw young kids reading, seven, eight-year-olds who were not my children, sitting out there, taking books, reading. And they were laughing to themselves. You could see the emotions change as the stories pivoted. And there was just so much, and so much joy those kids were having. And for me, it was like, Wow, this is this. I can't, I can't believe that you can create something which can give joy to people. Because for the first 12 years of my life, I was trying to create something which gave joy to me. It was like this is amazing, right? You're sitting out there, you're saying, "Wow, this is crazy." Young kids, and one more thing about young kids, eight, nine year old kids, is they don't they don't give me a story because they have to give me a story. They don't laugh because uncle is watching, you know. Uh, 
So they don't have any of those false notes around them. And uh, it made me feel so strongly about working with children that one more accident happened that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Nandan Nilekani's children used to come to the library and use the library. They used to stay in the same area. And because of my Infosys connection, I knew the family very well. And um, Rohini had come to the library one afternoon. And I was talking to Rohini and said, what are you doing, Rohini? What's, what's keeping you busy? And she mentioned to me that she's doing a lot of work with education of children in government schools. And, uh, you know, I was a jobless ex-entrepreneur. I said, can I come? Can I come and see what a government school looks like? I had never been to a government school. I was 32 years old. Right? I had never been to a government school. In the first 12, 13 years of, you know, I went to DAV, I came to IIT. Right? I worked in Infosys, worked in London, blah, 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 but never been to a government school. I did not even know that there existed a significant portion of India a significant, significant population of India that went into organizations and institutions to study, which was unimaginable. So I actually walked in with her, you know, not knowing what to expect. I don't know, you know, how many of you have come and studied in government schools or have visited a government school, but here's somebody who's coming from a mindset of, you know, having worked last in California, and saying, let's go to the government school. And at that point of time, in 2002, 2003, there was the India Shining Campaign. You know, it's like what we did a couple of days back, a surgical strike in Pakistan. So we all highly jingoistic right now, right? We are the sexiest country in the world right now, right? We can take care of our uh, enemies like that. So we were India Shining at that time, right? So everything you hear and everything you read about is only about how cool India is. And with all that... Times of India news information coming to you, you walk into this government school and I don't have a word to describe it. I felt so ashamed about being an Indian. I was like, this is not the way it should be. How can I at one point say, I am the world's knowledge economy and then 80% of my children go to schools like this. There was absolutely, absolutely no connect. My, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, make that thing meet, right? In my head, it was like complete blankness. And, and I said, you know what? I can fix this. Right? I think that's part of the entrepreneurship spirit, right? You always have to start with a premise saying, I can fix this. I can make this work. Uh, we took a small thing. We said we will work purely in the areas of making libraries and government schools work. It's again like, you know, trying to, uh, you know, clean up just one part of a big dirty lake. Uh, right? I'm going to make a library work. And we said we'll focus and make a library work. And in that two years of trying to make a library work, we struggled. 2004, we started the first five libraries. 2006, October, two and a half years of working on it. We could not make a significant impact in changing the way libraries worked in government schools. How do I make these children learn better? You know, you go into the schools, kids, kids can't read the language they are being taught in. They might be a Kannada medium school, Tamil medium school, they can't read the language they are being taught in and they're sitting in school. Just imagine kids doing physics too, day in and day out for 10 years. Right? I don't know how many of you taught physics too, but I failed physics too, right? Just imagine doing physics too for 10 years. Day in and day out, you walk in there every morning and the teacher is talking some gibberish in a language you don't understand, drawing stuff on the board, you are just copying it blindly in a paper and then you hope that you'll remember these patterns and you'll go back to an exam and crack it. That's exactly what is happening in education in our country. And we said, let's fix libraries. And uh, two and a half years of failure, and we were really smart people trying to address this problem. And that's when we realized that sometimes we become successful because we pick challenges. 
that are easy enough for us to conquer. You know, it's very easy to be successful that way, right? Let me find some Pokemon Go's in IIT Madras. Right? That's my challenge level for this evening. So we pick challenges that are easy and for two and a half years we struggled. We struggled, we had put money, educational consultants, we had done all kind of, you know, things written in the textbook. Hire consultants, find this, do that, all kind of stuff. And uh, I think we were nearly giving up, and there's an importance to giving up, but we were nearly giving up. Fortunately, we found a consultant who did the right things of changing the way we thought, and we came up with a solution. Now, this is a not-for-profit we ran. It was a foundation, right? It was a not-for-profit. We're not trying to make money on this. We came up with a solution to make libraries work for poor kids. Uh, we introduced this in 25 libraries in Karnataka in 2007. And uh, without needing Facebook or YouTube, this program was running in 10 countries in 2010. It was running in nine states of India, it was running in countries like Cambodia, Vietnam. So people had just taken what we had done, adapted for their country. And it was a very, very simple solution built on a certain amount of premises. But I bring this up because I think if smart people say, I'm going to fix a problem and put a challenge level and work hard at it, you can find a solution. And if you find a solution, that's, find a solution that is good, people will find you, find you. Because the customer word of mouth becomes so strong that before you know it, people are knocking on your door and saying, you know, we went to this library, we saw this program running. They told me, Hippocampus gave this program to me. Can you talk to me about it? Now, I've, I've met, I remember, I think I mentioned this, some, some 18 months back, I was talking at a World Economic Forum event in education. And after a dialogue on libraries, uh, a lady walked up to me. And she said, oh, you are Hippocampus Umesh. I said, yeah, did you do anything wrong? She said, no, I want to say thank you. Why? Because 100 libraries in Ladakh, we're using our Grow by Reading program there in Ladakh. And she had never met us, right? That's the beauty of uh, open source. You do something, you share it, and then it will have its own wings, right? In 2009, 10, I had done this, and uh, uh, again, by accident, I was sitting in a cup. It actually happened month in, a, in two or three months in a row. I was sitting in a... A village in Rajasthan and I was trying to uh, get these women to understand the importance of reading for their children and I remember this woman distinctly you know she looked like Malika Sharawat I don't know how many of you remember Malika Sharawat from right but you're sitting in a village on the ground you know village in Rajasthan it's pretty uh, hot it was like it was like February March time frame all these women wearing dupatta but this is very young lady looking like Malika Sharabat and she was really one of those uh, um, outspoken uh, women. She says, you're talking to me about all of this. I know that my child goes to school and he is not learning anything in school. So I said, it's your village, your school. Go and fix it. What's stopping you? And I thought, wow, I won the argument, right? Damn cool. I'm like, she said, I did. I went to the headmaster and said, this child is not learning. The headmaster told her, you are a Meena. Meena is one of those, you know, uh, cow herding castes in Rajasthan. You are a Meena. Are you going to tell me what education is? And, you know, so that was the first time I realized, you know, you read about all these things. But then you start realizing how, without actually saying it, people are living in the same community, how the prejudices are so strong that somebody who knows something is going wrong is actually powerless in a community because of just a certain amount of underplay of caste kind of stuff happening in the community. This happened, you know, a couple of other places to me, and then, you know, a month or two later, I was in Karnataka. And again, sitting in a village and uh, 
admiring the goat in the house and talking to her about how oh, your goat is so pretty and blah 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 blah. You know, take a selfie with the goat. I got the selfies with me, right? A beautiful goat taking selfies and all that. And this lady again stands up and says, "But you know, you're doing this work with libraries, but people are not reading. There is not too much of uh, education happening. There's absolutely nothing happening in terms of quality of education. The government school system is failing us." So I said, "I've been hearing this." and it's going to be next to impossible to fix this problem so easily how can the community be involved this is a very simple question how can the community be involved to fix this problem and she said the only thing community can give you is teachers and money for the teachers they can give you a space what else can we give you and i think that was pretty strong and i was like okay you know again taken her back again i'm i'm learning lessons from people who typically we think a oh, village lady what does she know she hasn't finished 10th and uh, then i was in a conference in isb a month or two later and there was this guy called james tuli who's a professor of education at newcastle university and uh, james had just published a book called the beautiful tree and uh, the title of the book beautiful tree uh, you know he's again one of those uh, indo files right he just loves india and has spent a lot of time in india um i believe the word beautiful tree came from a line which uh, gandhi had mentioned after macaulay had proposed the reforms in education in india of that saying that the way education should run in india is that every village needs to be self sufficient in all aspects including education and what gandhi dreamt of a situation where a person in the village stood up and said i will educate the children you take care of my needs so gandhi in a simplicity had thought of a barter system right and uh, the lady in the village a few months before had proposed something similar and in today's world it's a fee system and uh, the coincidence was just just too many and you know i was telling you guys a few months ago you know i had i had moved out of this whole business big stuff right we will do creative commons share stuff share innovations but these things got me to my third inning this is what i am doing right now in 2010 uh, we started a company called hippocampus learning centers uh with a singular aim of providing high quality education to uh people in villages of india uh, at extremely affordable prices uh, and uh, we started in 2011 as a first centers began 2011 today in 2016 we work in 310 villages uh we have uh, we run four schools the uh, we have had lot of people coming in and looking at the quality of education and the people are actually very uh impressed by the fact that in a period of we have been able to deliver an education quality which we charge roughly 3600 rupees as the average tuition fee per year just higher than the fee iit charged us for our education but <laughs> right 3600 rupees a year but we able to provide a quality which is very equivalent to what happens in cities of uh, bangalore and chennai uh, going further what many people came in and uh, remarked that what made it a lot more surprising for people was we were actually teaching children two languages in kindergarten kannada and english unlike cities in bangalore and chennai who are teaching kids just english so we're actually taking on a second language challenge and teaching kids two languages so when the children finished with us they could read two languages and the teachers we recruited were all local women they were not qualified montessorians those women if 
unfortunately their parents their parents or husbands had pulled them to come to city they might be working as maids in our homes those women were the teachers and i think what it taught me was there was an enormous potential in people we as a country have become a country which measure people by the degrees we have and the english skills we possess how well do you communicate we don't look at i i was i've been amazed at the true potential of these women to the extent that uh, uh, 12 months back um, uh, jpal which is a mit funded uh, uh, research project they actually came out and they have, they are actually spending a million dollars doing an academic evaluation of the learning of the children so doing a completely scientific evaluation of what our children are learning over a two or three year period because they believe that what is happening out here can be a role model for what's happening in ec around the world um, and uh, um, so i think that's where we started i'm actually very very excited about the my third innings and my third journey with doing this because as a as a short term goal i think it's a five or six year goal which we have we believe hippocampus will educate as many preschoolers as the entire country of finland at 1% the cost of finland and the reason why we are excited about achieving that goal is we believe that if we can demonstrate that i can deliver high quality preschool education to a lot of young children at the scale of a country then i'm creating a role model for many african countries to emulate i'm creating a role model for many poorer country poorer districts of india to emulate it is doable it's possible today if you walk into our centers you will find that all of these women are using tablets to record everything which happens in the center i think the level of automation i haven't gone to an iit classroom but level of automation in our centers is possibly higher than what happens in many engineering colleges around the world right children's attendance assessment monthly assessment parental demographics everything is captured electronically and available to us so we have a lot of data and we believe that some of these things will help us uh, uh, set a benchmark and do various things so i would like to end with i think uh, this and we running out of time possibly and i have a flight to catch uh, that you know when i look at my journey of entrepreneurship from the first time of saying why was i doing quark i made no money right and if i lost no money if i lost money iit wouldn't pull me up right it would be like entrepreneurship certificate given to him right maybe the jimkhana accountant would say bad quark coordinator that's it nobody else would know but i was doing quark one year second year i left uh, opportunities where i could make a lot of money to do stuff and uh, you know i would uh, uh, possibly uh, end it with uh, you know what uh, the current entrepreneurship guru of the world elon musk right said when he launched this the big rocket right the big freaking rocket for mars somebody asked him why are you doing this so he says the first because i believe we as civilization we need to have continuity we cannot be putting all our eggs in one basket which is the earth so we need to have a second place to go to but secondly most importantly for the challenge of doing it i believe we can do this and i and my team want to take a stab at that challenge it's very and you know reason why many iits become successful entrepreneurs is because from the time we are young our parents have taught us and said you can get an iit just apply yourself take on the goal you can get in there for many of us that was our first big challenge in life at 15 16 you 
And some of you got lucky with girls or boys before, but right? But for many of us, that was the first big challenge in life. And according to me, entrepreneurship is all about the challenges. And if you succeed in doing something very well, the rewards will follow. Whatever it might be. Right? For some people, the reward is fame. For some people, it's world peace. Okay? The rewards will follow. And, uh, and my last pitch for social entrepreneurship. Okay? I have no choice, but I have to make a pitch for social entrepreneurship. I think... Uh, and I think the best, the best role model for social entrepreneurship is Bill Gates. You know, Bill Gates, I think, one of the most solid entrepreneurs we have had for the last two eras. He built the valuable company and richest man in the world, XYZ. But when Bill Gates said he was done with Microsoft, You know, somebody like Bill Gates was very young when he was done with Microsoft, possibly 45, 50 when he was done with Microsoft. He said, I have to take on a challenge bigger than Microsoft. Because I'm going to spend the money I want. I'm going to spend $50 billion and all the enormous potential and energy I have as Bill Gates and the connections I have as Bill Gates. What can I do? And he said, I'm going to help solve some of the world's most pressing problems. So I think if you're looking for a real challenge, you know, after all your adventures in the corporate world, social enterprise beckons. Thank you. Now I would like to uh, open the stage for a quick Q&A session. How was the job scene this year, guys? You look so glum. Huh? <laughs> how was the job scene this year? Yeah. They're like, tell us how to get corporate jobs. Thank you. <laughs> hi. Uh, hi, my name is Nitin. I'm in my final year B.Tech Mechanical Engineering. So one, one practical question. So many people would have interest to do social entrepreneurship, but there is this practical problem of having money and settling a proper life before getting into completely social entrepreneurship. Because you may not make money, you may make money, but having a life is all have a stable stable career before going into doing these kind of things so what did what is the advice for uh, from you about this uh, see I can't give personal advice because right uh, my path was different but I know of enough so I think the social entrepreneurship space in the world has changed significantly from the NGO space the last 10, 15 years. Uh, social entrepreneurs possibly might not pay as well as Amazon or Google do. Uh, and, uh, but they don't pay badly. Right? There is, there is a significant amount of change uh, which has taken place. Uh, many social enterprises are uh, funded by venture capitalists who understand that you have to pay people well. Uh, yeah, as a percentile of payment, maybe they might be closer to the, you know, the bottom 20, 30 percentile and not in the higher end. Uh, but they don't, they don't pay badly. Okay. So they don't pay exorbitantly, but they don't pay badly. You know, we have staff in our office who earn between 20 and 30 lakh rupees a year. Social enterprise. Right. 
So that's giving an example. Obviously, they've got experience. And we have young kids who earn possibly, you know, three and a half to four lakh rupees a year. So just uh, starting off from college. So salaries are not bad. Uh, there are social enterprises which pay actually a lot better too compared to hippocampus, but uh, salaries are not so pathetic, not anymore. But it's a choice, right? You don't have stock options and, you know, all of those. But it's a personal choice. I know enough people like, uh, there's this organization based out of uh, 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 Rajasthan. I forget the name. The founder won a, a Max S. A. Award three or four years back. And he built an organization in the 80s, which primarily went into IITs and IMs. And uh, I think it was called Nirman, something with N. He went into IITs and IIMs and recruited IITNs and IIM graduates to work for India in the 80s, right? And he has been successfully doing that. So he possibly recruits six, seven such people every year and he's been doing that. And so, yeah, so I have, so I know some of them who finished from, I think, computer science from IIT Kanpur, they went to IIM Ahmedabad and didn't work, and then joined him. And he has spent uh, 86, 87, so 30 years doing stuff in social enterprise. And on the reason life, he's not like broke, right? And he's got the perks where Howard will call him to come and give him a seminar, all of those things. So. Nidhan, it's called Nidhan. That, that organization is called Nidhan, okay? And I forget the, he won a Maxis Award, the founder of that organization. Uh, I want to ask a question. Uh, after you like graduated from IIT, you spent uh, nine years in Infosys. You said that like just it was like nine days. So and uh, always uh, you wanted to do entrepreneurship. So uh, I want to ask that what was your experience of this nine years, or like what did you do? What I, what was the job there or no no not job. You wanted to do always? I always uh -huh. wanted to. So I was lucky enough uh, uh, that uh, it was a significantly entrepreneurial time at Infosys. Like I mentioned, right, the company was growing at a really, really fast pace. And it was very well respected. In the nine years, it had, it had grown from $200,000 to $500 million, right? Very respected, fast growth company. So somebody like me, I think they gave me most of the challenges I sought, right? Growth, managing teams, uh, customers, financial. It was a pretty good time, and that's the reason why they could keep me for nine years. So basically, you acquired all the skills which uh, you will be needing in the so people future. People ask me this, and I'm not trying to throw uh, cold water on this. You know, many times at forum, people ask me, when should one become an entrepreneur? I tell people, you have to go and get screwed in the corporate world for five, six, seven years. That's when you will relish entrepreneurship. Otherwise, you always feel the grass is greener. Right? And it's important because one more thing corporate world teaches, a good corporate, I'm not asking you to join an unethical corporate, a good corporate teaches you the value of processes, the value of customer service, the way you manage employees, good HR practices, how do you deal with people, which are extremely critical. So I, I always strongly recommend to people that if they want to be entrepreneurs, spend five, six years working in a corporate environment. Understand, there's so many things to understand in the corporate world. Uh, so you mentioned about hippocampus and uh, all these things, right? So one thing one thing I didn't get is like, uh, what is the model which is very different? So we have libraries around. So you are also putting up a library kind of thing. Uh, and there are, it's in societies where they don't probably have all the facilities which are available to those okay. kids. So, um, so, the, we have a, so we have a library program, which is a set of uh, programs and activities that we train existing libraries to do in their library, whether a government school or a 
slum library or wherever to help improve reading habits. The other part which I talked about was setting up preschools. So we do setting up preschool, which is very similar to uh, a Euro Kids or a Kids you see. The only difference is I am working in a rural community at one tenth the fee structure with teachers who are not so qualified trying to deliver similar results. And one more thing I wanted to ask is like uh, when you recruit your uh, uh, people who are going to teach in those communities, uh, many of them might not have uh, like if those kids are not educated, it's very possible that the parents are also not educated and they might not read, right, read and write. So how do you see the situation? Is it like they are already educated but just that the society is stopping them from uh, getting out kind of? Okay, uh, so so couple of points here. One is uh, uh, in the last few decades, India has made significant leaps in literacy and children going to school. Uh, I think they expect that in the next three to four years, as a country, we'll have 100% youth literacy, which means that people below 18 can be considered to be literate. So, you know, so we're going to have a significant, we'll have a very small number who will not be literate around the country. Uh, most states of uh, Karnataka, Maharashtra, uh, close to 50% of the women now, 20, 25 year olds, have been to school and have finished 10th. So they are educated. Uh, now the problem is that uh, there are twofold problems, especially for women. One is, if I come to a city for a job, so there are no jobs in a village. The only job in a village is to go and do farming or you know, sheep rearing and animal husbandry kind of work. Uh, so there's no job in a village. There's no job in a village that uses somebody who's done her 12th or done a BA. There's no job in a village. So assuming this girl is ambitious and the family is liberal, you know, Indian family, very conservative, right? Don't go too far and work daughter, stay at home. If the family is liberal, she wants to go out to work, she has to come to the nearest town or city. It's not like Chennai city has got so many jobs available for rural India. You know what I'm saying? Uh, rural Tamil Nadu might have a population of um, uh, 70 million people. Chennai has a population of 10 million people. Even if I try to get 10% of women to come there, will you give me 7 million jobs here? You can't. You can't even give me 7,000 jobs, right? So, the, so that's why if you look at the participation of women in India's labor force is one of the lowest in the world. It's a 24% participation of women in the labor force. So as a country, what is really, really pressing, and that's the big challenge is, how can you create more jobs? There are people. How can you actually create jobs that leverage the potential of what they are doing to make you know, if you can make 500 million people in this country earn, uh, let's say, annually $100, just imagine, you uh, know, $1,000, you can add so much to GDP. We just have a lot of people in this country who are not participating in any kind of gainful employment. So we are actually wasting human potential. And that actually is a big challenge of this country. And you know, you will hear the, you not only hear the current Prime Minister, but even the Prime Minister uh, of the past, right, uh, talking about trying to create 100 million jobs in 2020. And we have struggled. So you're looking at real challenges for the country, can we do something to create jobs? Not just in placement in IIT, but you know, <laughs> that's a real problem. Huh? So the goal which the country had said in 2010 was 100 million jobs by 2020. I think they have possibly hit 7 or 8 million. It's been 6 years. So we have a long way to go. Yeah. Thanks all of you. I hope I didn't bore you with too much gyan. Thank you so much sir for sharing your life experiences with us. Now I request Dean Ayanaya, Professor Nagarajan, to give a token of gratitude to Mr. Omesh Malhotra. Uh, no, I don't have it. Thank you. Thank you for having me.
थैंक यू सर थैंक यू ऑल फॉर अटेंडिंग द लेक्चर